Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2021 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Kurt Bullard, and I am a first-year MBA student at Sloan, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next panel, Trash Talking. Our panelists today are Sue Bird, point guard for the Seattle Storm, Andrew Friedman, president of baseball operations for the Dodgers, Daryl Morey, president of basketball operations for the 76ers, and Nate Silver, editor-in-chief in 538. Our panel today will be moderated by Jessica Gelman, CEO of Kager. This panel will run 35 minutes and we'll leave 10 minutes at the end for the end for questions. Please use Twitter with the hashtag trash talking to ask questions and Jess will ask them at the end of the panel. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Jess. Cheryl, you hear that? You're out. Yeah. I'm the moderator. I know. I thought it was king. both of us. All right. So you know that game where you play like Who's, who would you most like to have dinner with and you get to pick them? So this is this is it for me. I'd like to, do, you know, just have dinner with you guys. Except for Daryl. I have dinner with you all the time. So You said so, you weren't going to be mean to me this time. Just a little bit mean. It's a sign of affection and love, I think. Um, all right. So, guys, thank you so much for joining. And for the second time, because uh, you were on our Trash Talking podcast that, that we started this year. And uh, we had a lot of fun with you there, so we thought we'd bring it back here, but this time talking more broadly about analytics, uh, not specific to just one sport. So to get us going, uh, analytics this year has come under the gun for different reasons, in part negatively impacting the game. Daryl, recently you mentioned that threes should potentially be 2.5 points. Andrew, you seem to be a little upset about the lack of singles. Sue, don't know if you know this, but you only took eight shots in the paint during the WNBA regular season. So what rules need to change to catch up with the data? That's it. I, I, can I make a general point? And that's as we have these smart guys like Andrew and Nate, if he ran a team and Sue, when she runs a team. Um, owns. Yeah. Owns oh, a team. Oh, owns, yeah. She's probably going to be owns a team. You're right. Yeah. The rest of us are going to have to schlep as just the people who run them. Um, as people get smarter, basically all smart people do is exploit the rules. That's essentially our mission every day when we get up. And so the league office is going to have to be smarter about changing the rules, sort of like esports, where we're nerfing and buffing things all the time, or otherwise, you know, you're going to get you know, probably too many threes in the NBA and too many uh, flyouts or home runs and no singles for uh, baseball. So, folks, so, oh. yeah, go ahead, Nate. I have a weird NBA idea that I'm sure I'm stealing from someone, but I'm going to pretend that it's original just in <laughs> case it is. Um, what if you had, after you make a certain number of long twos in a quarter, it's like the bonus, they become worth three points, right? So once you make five long twos in a quarter, the rest of the quarter, a long two is worth three. Does that have to I, be a long two? It could be a short two too. No, it's gotta be a long two. It's gotta be outside the paint. Yeah. Okay. So I can't say who, but like someone had the idea that's like the flip of that, which is like, instead of making long twos worth more, they, they were like, just cap the number of threes worth three. So after, after you make 10 threes, after that, they're only worth two again, you know? So there, yeah, you can either, you can either yeah. nerf threes or we buff wanna, long twos. <laughs> you want to buff long twos, right? That creates more spacing. Um, it creates pretty interesting strategic equilibrium. Oh, true. I don't know. And higher scoring is fun. I like your idea to more buff long twos. That's a good idea. So you're saying like in the area that Sue apparently never went in last year, Make I only played words. 11 games. That makes me laugh. I only played, it was a short season. I played 11 games. So it's probably like right on par with my average. <laughs> but but imagine if Sue's shots just became th worth three. She We'd have to create a new Hall of Fame level just for her. <laughs> if, if she, if she, all her shots were not three, that's great. Do you guys ever worry when, when these topics come up about like history and numbers and records and how that impacts other generations? Only Andrew worries about that. <laughs> yeah, baseball is obviously really complicated with that. Um, and we've had the steroid era and uh, they've moved the mound height 
and the balls have changed, the properties of the ball. And so I think it's hard. The nostalgic part always wants to do it, but I think there's so many qualifiers when doing it effectively. And I know Nate spent a lot of time thinking about that, uh, but Daryl kind of nailed it from my perspective. It's about going as up to the line and straddling and finding any opportunity on the margins. It's not different than I was as an eight-year-old kid. Now it's just a little bit different. Uh, but it's going right up to the line and it's trying to find every advantage and inefficiency and, you know, rule that has unintended consequences that we can benefit from. That's kind of the scope of our job. And until you kind of close those things up, it's hard. So I think it's, I think it's interesting because like we're hearkening a little bit in saying we want to change the rules back to a different game, maybe than the game that's happening today. So the question is, what is that game in baseball, in basketball, that we think we prefer than some of the things that we're seeing right now? I love that question, Jess. I know in basketball that, that, it, that there's this notion in everyone's head that the ball moves a lot, and then there's a shot towards the end of the shot clock. It's either transition, like a bang-bang, you know, sort of exciting play at the rim, or it's a lot of ball movement followed by, you know, the poor defense scrambling around to a great open look that goes down. I think that's the vision people have in their head. I think there's one, like Kirk Goldsberry was talking in his book um, about how you want different types of players in the NBA to all have prototypes for success, right? That you're not limited by needing to have a certain type of skill set to be a valuable NBA player, right? That seems like it's kind of an interesting objective standard. In baseball, I skipped my fantasy baseball drafts last year, right? You know, I'm not used to like seeing seven out of nine guys in a lineup are projected to hit 20 home runs or more, right? And you have very few guys that are, are high OBP purely or high batting average and still the basis guys purely, right? And that feels to me like if you can't have different styles of players succeed and be reasonably valuable, then maybe something has been thrown off. I agree with that. I feel like, what is it always just, we talk about these lines about towing, it's towing the entertainment line with this like idea of taking or, or players being limited based on what they can and can't do, which isn't really like what basketball for me, basketball was all about. So for example, I really, I understand why the hack shack rule exists, but I don't like it. Cause to me, I'm like, if that person is a crappy free throw shooter, sorry, like not my fault, but work on it. So for them to be rewarded, that's where I get in the weeds on these things. But simultaneously, it's got to be entertaining, right? That's that's what this is, is is part of what this is about. And I guess go back, go that, ahead, Andrew. Sorry. The parallel with that in baseball is if they ban the shift. Very similar to what Sue was saying. If hitters can't adjust and have barrel control to hit to the open side, sorry. But if they do that, I get it. Um, in some respects. I mean, it, it's hard because from my seat, from my vantage point, it's all about winning. That's our guiding light. It's everything we're focused on. And I understand that where we've gotten may not be the most entertaining thing. I don't wear a fan hat when I watch baseball anymore. Um, but what's driving young fans interest and what kind of game do they want to see? I'm sympathetic to that. I just don't know the answer to it. And whatever comes of that, we'll look to figure out how to win within that. And so I'm kind of more focused in a more narrow band of just winning. Al Davis. <laughs> I hate you with, with baseball. I, oh God, with baseball, it feels like there are the obvious things they could do and they do everything except the obvious things, right? I mean, the obvious things are you, you move the mound back to improve the offense defense balance, right? And you add a pitch clock to improve pace of play. Um, I don't know why baseball doesn't do those things. They're testing those things, but like they're kind of beating around the bush until, and similar like in the NBA, if you really have a concern about three point shot, you can move, you can move the line back. We can talk about what that means for the corner three, right? Maybe the corner three goes away, right? But like, you know, the most obvious solutions people sometimes get cute with other ideas and, and overlook. Speaking of getting cute, like when people talk about banning the shift, to me, it seems sort of very strategically exciting to think about how you might put your players out on the field. And when they create rules like banning them or even defensive three seconds in the NBA or the old man-to-man -man rules, 
whenever you have to create these really like hard to understand esoteric rules like offsides in soccer, that, that means there's something more fundamental going on that's wrong. And we should just keep things simple. Like, I don't know why we can't put our five defenders wherever the hell we want and why you can't put your fielders wherever the heck you want. It's more interesting to me. I agree. I think anytime you're legislating rules like this, there's going to be unintended consequences. Things are going to fall out of it that they can't even process right now instead of letting the natural ability go out and play. And there are things you can do to the property of the ball. The mound is a big debate and argument. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do depending on what you're looking to create. If guys stealing bases more, you know, one issue we have in baseball, and we talked about on the trash talking podcast, is that like in the Olympics, world records are broken every four years pitchers are getting better every four years and the quality of arms and the volume of them today versus where it was even 10 years ago is dramatically different. So as hard as hitting was 10 years ago, it is that much more difficult today. And so I think the inaction, the swing and miss, the, the strikeout rate, that's probably not that interesting to fans sitting on their couch. It's really interesting to me when we're pitching. It's not that interesting to me when we're hitting. Um, but I don't know how you improve that because guys are throwing harder. They have more movement. They're throwing their fastball less because it gets less miss in other pitches. There has been this, you know, smarter approach to how to miss bats and take on less damage. You might've answered my question. I saw Jacob deGrom's opening day and I think he threw a hundred miles per hour, like 22 straight times in a fastball. So you're saying that's not common. I was just going to ask you if fastballs are taking over. It's not. It's not. As the velocity has gone up, the usage has gone down. Huh. That's really interesting. Just he's so, just so amazing. It doesn't doesn't matter yeah. with him. His ability to command it and put in, and most guys can't command it as effectively. And it's a pitch that has the lowest swing and miss. And so therefore, either guys hit it hard, or you just have a chance with a ball in play of something bad to happen. So the best way to eliminate that is either induce a pop up or get a strikeout. Well, it's really interesting. I'm a big because, fan of, of. Go ahead. I was actually going to ask Sue, as someone who's actually gone through not ten, a little bit more than that years, and actually been playing with the players as they've been changing. What are like the biggest changes that you have seen from the athletes who you're playing with today, and kind of that acceleration of I don't know what you want to call it. Is it athleticism? Is it training? Yeah, I mean, there's an element of survival of the fittest, right? Like with each in the WNBA, what's unique is just the small amount of roster spots. So 12 teams, 12 spots with every draft class. I always joke, then there's like a-holes like me who just won't retire. So there's not a lot of retirement, but there's always a new draft class. So again, it's just the athleticism part is legit survival of the fittest. Um, but what you're seeing, I think, is very similar to what we see in all sports, which is like, well, maybe it's specific to basketball taller people are now able to do more. They're just, they're just more athletic. They're more coordinated. So now they're, you know, they're ball handling more, they're shooting off the dribble more, they're shooting threes more. And that kind of weeds out some things. It weeds out. And we talked about this when, when I was on the pod with you guys, it, like it weeds out the, the huge post player who, who's very limited and it kind of weeds out the smaller guards who, who aren't, don't have the size. Um, with that, what's still maintaining even though I just said it's weeding out some of those big post players, tall players still have a huge advantage in women's basketball. Cause like we talked about, there's no way to really counteract that. There's no strength that counteracts that height. Um, but yeah, it's just getting more and more versatile. And I think with every time that we've moved the three pointer back, everybody's just adjusted for, for maybe a limited amount of time. People don't shoot it as much or as well. And then two, three, whatever many years later, we're all fine. You know, it all just kind of adjusts. I think Joel Embiid is like the pinnacle of the evolution of NBA players. He can defend, he can dribble, pass, shoot at seven one, seven two. What's the WNBA equivalent of Joel Embiid? Um, we Elena? Don't, yeah, we don't really have anybody that big. Like who's well, the big seven big? one? I know. Yeah. <laughs> I <don't> know. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't mean, I mean more so like like the tallest player is still the Brittany Griner, like a Sylvia Fowles, like traditional centers. But mm -hmm. when you talk about Elena Deladon, you just mentioned Brianna Stewart, those are like six four, six five. 
that can do everything on the court. And you're just seeing more and more players like that. Mm-hmm. Can I go back to one of Sue's points to ask Andrew a question, which is on the history? Like, how much have you personally gotten hate that you played seven inning games? Are like the Dodgers fans like losing their minds about this, or they do they cut? Do they still wait to come till inning three and still try to leave in inning five, or what's the situation? We haven't played a home game with fans yet. Tomorrow's day one. Okay. We're on the road for the first seven. Um, but you know, I think like a lot of rules that come up, it's very split. I've heard passionate takes on both sides of it. Um, and so my guess is our fans are no different and feel very strongly on either extreme. And you want longer because you guys are better, right? You'd, you'd rather have 20 inning games, right? Um, <laughs> there's a roster management aspect that's tricky where you're sending guys down and those last four or five innings, you're counting pitches, you're telling your AAA pitching coach not to pitch a guy. It, it gets awkward and you're sending guys out after that game just to get up fresh arms. I actually appreciate that it doesn't go as long. Um, but I, to your point, I should want it to go a little bit longer. It's just so messy to come out of that I guess just uh, it's my laziness that wins out there. Well, yeah, where does Andrew's quality of life come into winning? Like, does does it overlap at some point? Or like hitting 12? And you're actually worried about my quality of life. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, your standing desk. I mean, this is, this is a, new, a new Andrew. It's good. I like it. I mean, I think that – um, number of pitchers on a roster is an underrated factor in, in um, the dominance of pitching, right? If you know you're going to throw 105 pitches max, right? If you know you're going to throw one inning max, I mean, that makes a bigger difference than people realize. And I'd be a fan of uh, limiting rosters to 10 pitchers plus an emergency pitcher, like an emergency goalie in the NFL. You have to phase that in over some period of time. I'm sure some middle relievers would not like that. Um, but that would force pitchers to, to pace themselves a little bit more. But how do you know someone's a pitcher, Nate? Like, I, like that's sort of another awkward rule. Like, you have to I write a whole label these. Guys? I mean, you have to label them, right? If they meet some threshold, then you can have a two way player, right? And that's fine. But you have to have a certain number. You have to have like, you know, one plate appearance for every inning pitch or something like that, right? Over some period of time. And that would cultivate two way players, which is objectively cool and awesome so you want more of that yeah yeah it, it seems like an awkward rule you just said you don't want so that's all i'm saying all right i'm gonna switch it up a I little mean, bit should... here oh sorry no. i was gonna let you if you no. want to go back if you want to go back at daryl that's fine i'm always appreciative of that but uh he's just gonna keep it's like a presidential time. debate i have my can i have yeah. my no, I, i'm I'll, I'll, <laughs> let, I'll let this exchange go <laughs> <laughs> all right so want to talk a little bit about momentum versus data. So as most of us know, last year at the World Series, data suggested that Blake Snell should be pulled in, uh, in, in the third loop around of uh, not seeing the uh, next order of hitters again. Sorry for really butchering that. Um, there was a lot of heat that was taken for that decision in, for, from some people, although um, it, some people agreed with it, obviously, as we know. Um, they ended up losing that game as in potentially in part. So wanting to talk about momentum, what work has been done in this space? When do you decide to deviate from that plan and what work remains to be done there? And I actually wanted to start, I know um, Andrew and Nate and Daryl will have a lot of thoughts on this, but Sue, I wanted to start with you. Sorry, because you're actually, I want to start with you, not specifically on that situation, but as a player who kind of what I would say feels momentum And, you know, the difference between what the data says, which, you know, your GM or coach might be saying versus what you on the court are actually experiencing, because I think that that is something that hasn't really been touched in a meaningful way. I was going to say, I'm like, start with me. I'm like, I'm definitely not doing work in any of these. (laughs) So I have nothing um, enlightened to share other than, yeah, I think as a player, you do feel momentum. I think there are moments and I think those that, thrive in those moments you just all the analytics or maybe the stats for a player like it goes out the window when you're feeling it that's that's what it feels like again I'm not gonna have any like math or data to back any of this up other than it's a feeling and it definitely exists I think we'll we've seen it you know the one thing I'll throw in actually 
is the lack of fans, I think, have sh has shown a little bit of how the emotions of a game can impact things because they, they, they bring the emotion. So now that they're out of it, you're kind of seeing like some better play. They're not negatively impacting. Some shooting percentages are higher. So I do think that that speaks, what I'm bringing that up, is that speaks to the feeling of a game and what momentum can feel like, honestly, on both ways. You feel it when you're, when you're not the team with it too. Can I ask you a question, Sue, on that? So you're playing and you're playing really well, but your normal rotation out of the game is coming up. Do you ever tell the coach like, no, no, leave me in? <laughs> um, no, no, I, no, no, I've never done that. You the, don't get mad when they pull you after you made like five in a row or something. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I learned early in my career that, okay. So maybe if it was in the fourth quarter, I might, but this is going to sound like some sort of non humble brag that doesn't really happen to me in the fourth quarter. <laughs> So like I'm good um, and I learned early in my career like get the rest early because once if you miss that opportunity early you can't get it back at the end you're just kind of screwed um so no I've never been like coming out. <laughs> and, the, and then I I think to boil down Jessica's question earlier to Andrew Andrew when they took him out of the game in that game were you did you were you happy or were you not happy or you just were too stressed to even have any thought I was really happy. So emotionally, oh. emotionally, I was really happy. And, you know, you're so vested in the game and each pitch that there's very emotional reactions for me in game. I can then process later after the game or the next morning and think through it more logically. In the moment, I'm very emotional. And you know, obviously there's been a lot written about this as if had they left him in, it definitely would have worked out. And it's the yeah. alternative universe. It, it's easy for people to say, oh, if they would have left him in, he definitely would have. And not that this means anything, but they juxtaposed, we faced Max Scherzer in 2016 in a deciding game of the playoffs. Through six innings, Scherzer and Blake Snell's lines were identical. They left Scherzer in against us, whereas they pulled Blake Snell. Both times we hit a homer off Scherzer the next inning. Uh, both games we ended up winning three to one. That's more just coincidence than anything. Um, but all the work that's done on third time through is very real. And there are very few people that are immune to it. And even when pitchers are pitching really well, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're less susceptible. And now you can get into, he had all his pitches working plus command, and there's probably layers to this that maybe you can definitely argue. It's just interesting as so many people talk about it as if had they left him in, they definitely would have won game six and then who knows in game seven. I don't think it's that black and white. Follow up, if you were another, Jacob. Another example. Rom, is, oh. oh, go ahead, Nate, sorry. Another example is the, um, infamous in New York Matt Harvey game in game six of the 2015 World Series, right, where I was at that game, um, eight shutout innings. He was pleading with Terry Collins to stay in the game. The fans were pleading. I mean, literally, if that had been a road game, he would have been taken out, right? Um, comes back out, first two guys, going to base, Royals wind up winning, I guess, 32 or whatever it was, and, like, total disaster. So there are examples different ways. I mean, you know, I, like, I think sometimes, um, you know, if you look at poker hands for example whether you should raise or fold or fold or call right a lot of hands you're like basically indifferent i think people should recognize like there is a space where like you're kind of indifferent between different options fairly often when that's the case go ahead with the conventional wisdom go ahead with momentum go ahead with your gut feeling go ahead with whatever's going to go over best with the team and i think maybe some teams kind of slice a little too narrowly for decisions where it's very very close um but, you know, but I'm not sure if Matt Harvey, who was always kind of, you know, was coming off injury and stuff like that, that probably wasn't a very close decision. That was probably an objectively disastrous decision. And, and <laughs> you know, and, uh, and you see the all the consequences of that. The one, thing, the one thing I would just throw out there from a player standpoint, and this might be more specific to like a baseball scenario where there seems to be, to Nate's point, like some hard lines on these, on these decisions, like this is what we will do. I feel like 
if I were maybe running a team, this is not me saying any kind of advice. I don't really know baseball that well, but I might leave it like open-ended, even if in the back of your head, you know what you want to do, because that can mess with a player. If I'm a pitcher and I know I'm about, I'm supposed to be taken out and then maybe I'm left in because they think I want to be, that might put this added pressure. You know, I was just thinking of it like, wow, like imagine you're Matt Harvey, you beg to stay in and now you're like, oh crap, like I better, you know, like this better go my way or else you look like, not so great. Uh, so I agree with you. Um, we work really hard to keep all of those things away from the players. Just let them instinctually go out and play the game. Um, and there are things that are open-ended. There's just different kind of decision tree points throughout the game that baseball, like we have been accused of scripting out games. It's literally impossible to script out a baseball game in advance. There are so many different pathways it goes down. And so it's more just whenever you get to decision points, it's weighing the options and just making calculated bets as you go. Um, but for our, from our standpoint, we don't want our players inundated with information or the thought process behind things, unless they ask after the fact the next day and kind of talk through it. But while providing them opportunity to get more rope, to go deeper into games and to do things and get into the why and challenge them. Yeah, How good is your decision-making unit on making those weighed bets during the game? And how good are your competitors, Andrew? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think the game in the last 15 years, I think the decision points that are, you know, are kind of 2080 for the most part are pretty uniform at this point. And it's kind of the 45-55, the 48-52. Uh, that's a lot more difficult. And there are a lot of times that I disagree with what our manager, Dave Roberts, does. And a lot of times it works out that I would have been wrong. You know, there's those things that are on the margins um, that are way more difficult. Um, but I think the extremes in-game um, are pretty uniformed at this point of kind of the more no-brainer stuff. Whereas 15 years ago, you saw a lot of, you know, quote unquote, you know, bad bets happening way more frequently. Well, what, uh, not to put you on the spot for one more time, how, what are those 45, 55 type calls that come up and how can you know you were wrong given to your point earlier? We don't know the other, you just know that it worked out. Yeah, I mean, I love talking about those after the game with Dave, and I prefer them to have worked out differently than what I would have wanted, because it just always makes for an easier conversation, because it's not second guessing at that point. It's, hey, I would have done this, and the way it played out, I would have been wrong, but curious why, it, you know, what you guys were thinking in the dugout, and, um, you know, the National League game back this year with no DH, there's a lot more strategy to whether you walk the eight hole hitter, um, you know, whether you bring in a guy that you're looking to get more than three outs, but his spot's going to come up and whether or not you double switch. I mean, there are a lot of in-game decisions that have future costs. And so it's trying to appreciate the future costs in that moment and weighing it all um, that I think lands you in that kind of gray that you can passionately argue different sides of. All right, I'm going to switch it up here. Uh, so throughout this, throughout the throughout the podcast, we have talked about a very hot topic has been which position in a particular sports is the most impactful. So let's take it across all of sports. Examples: quarterback, pitcher, primary ball handler in basketball, etc. So you can have whatever argument you choose. Uh, on this one, but I'm going to open that one up. Nate, why don't you kick us off on that one? I mean, it's a close call between an NFL quarterback and an NBA uh, superstar, I would think. Um, and on a single game basis, a baseball pitcher might be the most impactful in a one game base. So that's probably actually pretty close because, you know, um, but yeah, I, I there shouldn't be that much debate about it i don't think like if you actually try and get this debate now about whether well, is you just Tom said Brady... three you just said three so i don't okay. know which position you're saying is the most impactful what's the one across all the sports i think it's probably I, this is like a tom brady question kind of right 
Because Tom know. Brady produced more wins on a you know percentage basis than like Michael Jordan or LeBron James did. It's probably really close if you actually try to work out the math, I think. But then you so have to wear in Belichick and all kinds. Of, it's hard to untangle. I thought we solved who's more valuable, Brady or Belichick. I thought that's been solved. (laughs) (laughs) I I thought we finally have isolated it. (laughs) I'm pretty surprised to hear that a a person who's only on the field for half the time would be who you would think, who you would suggest would be my perspective on that one because they're not having influence in theory for half the game. I think it's pretty clear. It's not even close. The answer is if your on-ball, offensive on-ball player is your superstar in basketball, that is the biggest impact. I don't even – I wouldn't even think quarterback or those others are really all that close. So – Nate, you have 30 seconds to refute that. (laughs) Well, no, I mean – but I mean, Vegas lines imply that, like, replacing um, an elite quarterback with replacement of a quarterback can be worth – four or five wins in a 16 game season. Right. So that starts to get close to, you know, an NBA player being worth 22 ish to 25 ish wins the MVP type player. Yeah. That that's yeah. Damn it. (laughs) Took you one, you took you one argument. Wait, I'm supposed to be a political argument. I'm supposed to not acknowledge his (laughs) fact. I need to distract away. Uh, Sue, you have any perspective? Yeah, the only thing I might argue is if you take your best basketball player off the team, that lead player, you literally have no chance. I don't know that you can ever recover what you lost. Whereas, and just because we're using football as the the other side of this, whereas you might have a Tom Brady who clearly dominates offensively, but then you had a Peyton Manning win with Denver when it was just, he just had to hand it off, make a couple first downs, and a defense did the rest. There was other ways to like make up for, you know, what he couldn't do in that moment, even though he's a Hall of Famer. So that that would be my only that would be my lean towards basketball. Obviously, it's a guard if we want to just talk basketball. Nobody would ever tune in to five centers playing against each other. It'll be a shit show. So it's obviously going to be your your lead guard. Well, you've probably played against football players too, and that's basically if you play against football players, that's what you get is five <laughs> five centers. Uh, I have a question. What is, do you know Seattle's or record or the, your team's record when you haven't played so over your career? No, I don't. Good is question. It, they did really well. They were like, they did really well this summer. I had a, a, an injury in our 22 game season. That's why I only played 11. I think they went like either 10 and one or nine and two. They did well. Now, what do you prefer? Really? You want them to do well or not as well? <laughs> no, trash talking has lie detectors. So, lie so you can't. No, I want, I mean, if, maybe if you asked me when I was 25, the answer might be different. Now I'm like, please do well so we can be higher in the playoffs. <laughs> not as hard when I come back. <laughs> there, are definitely, there are definitely players who would prefer their team does poorly when they're out. There's no doubt. But go ahead, Nate, sorry. Well, it's some event like RAPM or whatever, right? You look better if your teammates suck when you're not playing. So, no, I mean, one more thing I'd say, Daryl, to give you credit on the NBA versus quarterback question. I do think like an NBA player in game seven, right? Like if LeBron James or Kawhi Leonard are max effort on both sides of the ball and they could sustain that, which they can over a whole season, then they might win worth 35 wins a year or something insane, right? These guys are pacing themselves in the playoffs where they're playing more minutes, right, on both full effort at both sides of the court, that's hard to beat, even for even for a quarterback. I know not of these people you speak. Um, I'm <laughs> attempting to not get fined today, so. All right. <laughs> fined. Um, the under on that, by the way. Yeah. I'm going to fine you regardless, Daryl. All right. So. Andrew, have you been fined yet? You need to get fined. Have you, have you been fined? Uh, I have. But not as many oh. times. I'm not as good at it as you are. <laughs> what are, what are you fine for? Lead. Can you can you tell us what you're fine for? I cannot. Can't? I cannot. Oh, it was like one of those secret <laughs> fines. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna help Andrew out and move the discussion along. All right, move on. Move on. Oh, I think we right, need questions. Gonna, we don't have ten minutes. No, no, no. We're we're gonna get to questions in a second. But first, we're gonna do game time. <laughs> Bench trade or tag? All right, we're gonna do. Greatest buzzer beater shots in March Madness, um, men's, sorry, Sue, 
and CAA history. If you had a March Madness one, we would have put it in though. Um, I know you have a Big East one. So greatest buzzer beater shots, bench, trade, or tag. These are good ones. Okay, number one, Leitner versus Kentucky in the 1992 Elite Eight. Overtime, 104-103 was the final score. Chris Jenkins, Villanova versus UNC for the title in 2016. Final score, 77-74. Jalen Suggs, Gonzaga versus number 11 UCLA, final four this past year. Final score, 93-90. You have to say why. Who wants to go first? Yes, Sue. Sue. I'll get it over with. Um, okay. Tagging, which means we're franchise tagging. Is that, okay. Yeah. The um, Villanova one, because that's for a championship, so I want that immediately. I'm going to bench the Jalen Suggs. Lo- great shot. Got us, got us into the final, uh, into the final game. And I'm actually going to trade the Leitner shot because that has probably the most value. So I feel like I'm going to get a lot in return. <laughs> there we go. I love it. I think we can't top Sue's answer. We should just go to the next one. <laughs> All right. Does anyone else have I would, disagree I would, with? I would bench Leitner as revenge for him somehow being picked for the 1992 Dream Team over Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> uh, I just want to give a shout out to Jay Wright, the coach of Villanova, who said bang before the shot went in. He knew it was going in and had the best coach celebration at that moment. So, Well, and that was the one to win the title. So hard to argue with it. All right. So now we're going to go up a level. Greatest clutch moment ever across all sports. All right. Bench, trade, or tag. Number one, Megan Rapinoe's cross to Abby Wambach for the header in the 2011 Women's World Cup against Brazil in stoppage time. I think there was literally 15 seconds to go. That tied the game. Number two, Adam Vinatieri's field goal to beat the Oakland Raiders in 2002. That was a snowball, the last game at the then, I can't even remember, the Foxborough Stadium. And lastly, Kirk Gibson of the Dodgers walk-off home run in game one of the 98 World, 1988 World Series versus Eckersley in the Oakland days. What? Well, we have Andrew on. He's like forced to answer one of these, basically. Well, I also have uh, Sue on (laughs) with Megan Rapino. So. Oh, true. Yeah, this is just not fair. Nate has to answer, it appears. No, I think everyone can give their opinion. (laughs) I I recruit myself. (laughs) Recruit myself. I figured you Nate. I I say Nate. I mean, I, you know, I, I have a Detroit Tigers hat on. So we had ambivalent feelings about Kirk Gibson. Although the Dodgers are always my second favorite team. My dad's from LA, so I, I think you got to go with, uh, with Gibby because, like, literally, if he had made a home run, I'm not sure he could have made it <laughs> around the four bases, right? So it's total <laughs> all in and kind of an amazing moment, obviously. That's your. I mean, it, it can't it can't be a kicker. That much I know. It can't involve like a kicker. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I go with Adam Vinatieri only because my son was born that day. So I'm going with Adam Vinatieri. All right. So here's a couple questions that have come in. Uh, All right. What would be the most effective roster rule change to your respective sport? So I think this is about trades. Yeah, Yeah, for, for mine, it's easy. I would want the ability to do conditional compensation like the NFL. So if you make a trade and you make the playoffs, you have to give the team more. And if you don't, you don't, you know, basically it would grease the skids to a lot of trades. I don't, I don't even know if you can do that in baseball. I know the NFL can do it. So. I can answer for Andrew true. He wants to trade draft picks. I already know the answer. <laughs> You're right. I, I would want to, I would want to add. Um, it, he could answer for me. Go ahead, Sue. Daryl answered for right. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would want to add bird rights. We need to add that. That's the Do next. Bird rights? Larry. Yeah. Bird rights. Actually, would be me as well, since I'm that player right now. But <laughs> are you gonna, Sue? Are you gonna try and replace the logo like like uh, some some Jerry players want to? <laughs> want to replace them. They should now be called Sue Bird rights for sure. Larry didn't fight for anything. You're fighting for things. Larry just got named it and didn't do anything. <laughs> so 
So they should for sure be Sue Bird rights. All right, you start, you start using that. Use that in your negotiations. I'm gonna keep uh, Joel Embiid Sue Bird rights for next year. <laughs> Joel, Joel would definitely tweet that for sure. So. Nate, what do you think? Anything specific? I mean, I, I think anything where you are allowed to draft a player and allow him or her to continue to play in college while you retain their rights and they get compensated somehow, or at the very worst, get some insurance mechanism if they are somehow injured in their final season. Um, the NHL, I know the rules least well of all the major sports, but they allow some version of that, right? And I don't see why you wouldn't find some way to kind of save college basketball in the NBA and, and let a guy get college experience and uh, come out more seasoned. It just seems like kind of a win-win potentially. All right. Here's another one. What is the greatest in-game tradition? The example here is the seventh inning stretch. I don't know the basketball is any, so I think we're, we lose. Yeah. We do a, we do like a, Everybody get up. It's time. And they do like a train ride. <laughs> or no, maybe it's the, no, I'm sorry. It's come on, ride the train. That's what it is. Come on, ride the train. And they, all the kids do a train Congo thing around the court. There it is. That's what That's I'm it. Saying. I say baseball wins just because they've been around for like 8 billion years. Like, <laughs> like in a hundred years, basketball might have some tradition that matches the Seventh inning stretch. I, I, I Sue Bird writes, Daryl, you should come up with something that can last uh, all of time. I actually like the hockey. You know what hockey does? This is actually a, a little bit. They do the, the, like 50, the octopus. 50. No, no, no. They do the fifty at most games. This is like a thing. It's part of the hockey culture where like you you put money in and you'll win. Everyone puts money. That's in. like every sport, Jessica. No, but it started in hockey. I'm not I mean, sure. The, I think the, baseball the hat did trick, it first. Throwing your hat. Throwing your hat. Oh, on that's a good one. For a hat trick is a pretty good tradition. That's a good one. That's a good one. I think the Boy Scouts started 50 50 raffles, Jessica. <laughs> I'm kidding. Sorry. It's a big, I, I, I went to a hockey game and I heard and I saw it and I was like, this is great. We'll talk about community, doing good things for the next generation. I loved it. I think throwing a live octopus on the on the ice is probably the worst tradition. Let's, let's get rid of that one. So. so, all right. If you could measure an intangible, which of the following would it be? Heart, clutchness, or EQ slash good teaming? I want EQ, like because EQ makes the coach like you, and then if the coach doesn't like you, you're dead in the NBA. So. I want to measure EQ really well. What was the what was the first one? Sorry, heart. Heart. Oh, Can like you be between uh, heart and clutchness. Yeah. You think they're the same? I, there's enough overlap that I'm having a hard time separating. I mean, it's people who get labeled as having heart don't tend to get labeled as not clutch performers. Hmm. So whether they're misused or not. It seems like there's a lot of overlap between them. So if we're measuring nonsense, you don't you're you're having trouble separating <laughs> your nonsense. Is that okay? All right, let's check. Uh, I would go clutch. Clutch. I mean, clutchness is is somewhat measurable though, right? I mean, if you somehow knew that a guy was like a five sigma clutchness, that would be very valuable. But I would go with Daryl's answer. I think like what effect does a guy have on his teammates? Um, you know, someone who's difficult to manage. I don't care what the business is that has a lot of consequences so i'm definitely clutch or heart depending on which definition more <laughs> lines up with how i'm processing it in my brain i'm one of the what's, what's interesting about the eq is i feel like i know that answer for all my teammates hmm. like me I, and i get it, i have a different I like I have a yeah answer. all right let's go through them sue yeah. sue let's go through them one by one let's yeah. let's get your measure <laughs> All right. So last question. This one uh, came in from the from the crowd. It's for you, Sue. If the WNBA expanded tomorrow and they gave you a chance to buy a team, but you had to retire, what do you do? Um, and I have to buy an expansion team. Um, <laughs> that's that's a great question. In Seattle. Um, I think from what I hear, I think Portland would probably be my number one. They have like 
great following for, for sports in general, women's sports. Um, and I miss the I-5 rivalry. I really do. It was a great yeah. rivalry for the one year that the Portland. Portland, Portland is a great basketball town, town. Can confirm having having to go there all the time. And all right. Our, well, we should gonna, met, met, yeah, mention our crack staffs. Yeah, our, well, I was going to say, to, to end this discussion, Sue, just so you know, when you were on the court this past year, the Storm had a 58% regular season winning percentage. And oh, this oh, is sorry, career. Career, career, sorry, career. And when you were off the court, it's only 46%. So difference maker right there. I need, All right. I, need that. I just renegotiated. I just renegotiated. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say, Andrew? It's the opposite of trash talking, but that's an awesome stat. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you all so much. And uh, thanks to our audience for, for tuning in. Thanks. Thank you guys. That's good for thank moderating. You. I'm happy it was you and not Daryl. <laughs> he kind of moderate. He kind of moderate. He was just going right at you, Andrew, oh, like yeah. the whole time. <laughs>